Cool. All right. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody, students, faculty, guests. Uh, I'm Sam Hilke, and I'm a first year uh, PhD student here at Sesame at the doctoral program and the Berkeley Graduate School of Education. And welcome to the spring 2022 Sesame Colloquium series. Uh, and it's a beautiful uh, March 10th day. I think most of us are probably inside, unfortunately, but hopefully we got outside a little bit today because it is really gorgeous out. I rode my bike here, so I had 15 minutes of nice, but that's a wildly short amount of time to be outside in a day. Um, anyway, today is uh, a Zoom session, so we're kind of joining from all over, but at least I see three of you are about 75 feet from me in the same building, so that's pretty cool. Um, and I'm hoping that wherever you are, you're going to enjoy this 90 minute uh, session we have today. And I calculated that out, and I think it's about 22.5 degrees of Earth rotation. And so I could also <laughs> say that I hope we enjoy our 22.5 degrees of Earth rotation here. Um, anyway, uh, so more and more online resources are being used for research pedagogy. And this trend has only been accelerated by the pandemic. I mean, for instance, right now, look at what we're doing here, though this I would say, I don't know, I'll have to ask Lloyd later if Sesame used to be on Zoom or if that's just a result of the pandemic. But, you know, I think we've all are experienced that. And then today is on Zoom and I stole that from, I think somebody else pointed that out, very interesting. Anyway, our guest speaker today is Professor Simon Penny, and he's going to discuss this sort of rapid development of online pedagogy with respect to sympathies with traditions of the academy and the history of digital computing. Um, Dr. Penny is a professor of electronic art and design at University of California, Irvine. Um, I think those are the aardvarks. Um, so it's pretty good. Maybe the anteaters, actually. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> zot, zot. Uh, with appointments in the Department of Music and Informatics and, and in Informatics. And is also a guest professor at Nottingham Trent University School of Art and Design. Dr. Simon Penny is an artist, a teacher, and theorist and a long-standing focus with a long-standing focus on emerging technologies and on embodied and situated aspects of artistic practices, along with a critical analysis of computer culture. This has led to a focus on what he refers to as a post-cognitivist approach to cognition. And um, the focus of his 2017, this was the focus of his 2017 book from MIT Press titled Making Sense, Cognition, Computing, Art, and Embodiment. Also, um, Dr. Penny chaired the uh, 2016 conference at UC Irvine titled A Body of Knowledge, Embodied Cognition, and the Arts. And then furthermore, uh, Dr. Penny researches and advocates for uh, and advocates for indigenous Pacific traditional seafaring. Um, this sounds especially interesting to me. And in 2017, he chaired an, at Irvine a gathering named An Ocean of Knowledge, Pacific Seafaring, Sustainability, and Cultural Survival. Um, he is also co-originator and co-director of the Industrial Craft Research Network, which first, uh, first gathered in November 2021, so still very new. And I'm sure that Dr. Penny will be glad to tell you and all of us much more about that network which sounds um, incredibly fascinating and I'm sure curates very, very interesting research. Um, as professor of art and robotics at Carnegie Mellon from 1993 to 2000, uh, Dr. Penny developed virtual reality and um, robotics projects. And then he went on to found the arts computing, the arts computational engineering graduate program at Irvine. And that was between 2001 and 2012. And he has held uh, faculty positions in cognitive systems and interactive media at um, all sorts of international institutions as well. Today, Dr. Penny's talk is titled Living in Map World. You can see this right in front of us. Living in Map World, the Academy, the Representational Idiom, and the Shift to Online Everything. So we're going to begin with uh, Professor Penny's presentation. And afterwards, we'll have time uh, for questions from the audience. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Professor Penny. Well, thank you so much, Sam. And hello, everybody. Thank you, Lloyd, for the invitation. Um, and uh, Sam, I, I do like a geodetic reference, so that was much appreciated. Um, so, yeah, um, today I want to discuss a set of issues that have inevitably been front of mind for many of us during the pandemic as we teach, learn, and research. I want to reflect on the rapid transition to online resources, 
for pedagogy and research, and in particular to draw attention to ways in which equivalences may have been too hastily assumed between uh, online IRL experiences and, uh, sorry, and online experiences. I'll focus on the representational nature of all online phenomena, videos, animations, simulations, images, graphs, diagrams, models, numerals, and texts as a critical lens through which these issues are discussed. The paper, the paper argues that there are usually fundamental differences between an action conducted in the world and online simulations of such activities. And I argue that such differences should be considered in the design of online environments for pedagogy and research. The rapid development of online pedagogy is seen as a convergence of three factors, traditions of the academy, the history of digital computing, and neoliberal pressures on education. Arts practices and pedagogy here serve as a foil in the discussion. The commitment of arts of the arts to materiality and performativity results in an ontologically different kind of knowledge practice. So I bring to this discussion four years of teaching, sorry, four decades of teaching three decades of active involvement in the development of interactive digital technologies and two decades of working in research in embodied and inactive cognition but i am not an education scholar so i beg some indulgence and i hope that my remarks are found relevant in this context If there's any uh, jumps in the paper, it's because I trimmed it down from a longer paper, but don't hesitate to uh, ask questions. I'm looking forward to the discussion at the end of the talk. So, and please tell me if I forget to advance the slides. My slides are not advancing. Well, that is really annoying. Excuse me for a minute. I, I'm going to have to somehow reset Keynote. Uh oh. Oh, look at that. Can you now see slide number two? Not yet. I can see it. You I, can't see I think it. you just got to reshare um, your screen. Unfortunately, I can't do that with, without escaping out of Keynote. Right? It's, I was saying to Lloyd that Keynote does not play very nicely with Zoom. So um, I will try again to share. Let's try it this way. Do you have my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, and can I advance my? Are you seeing slide two? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. That looks great. The uh, the the slides in in bold are simply section names, section titles. So we in the West, and especially we who sit in the academy, have embraced assumptions about the authority of symbolic knowledge. Whatever our discipline, we generate texts. That's our job. We generate streams of alphanumeric characters that purport to capture something abstractly general about the world. Whatever the discipline, we mine the world for symbols. We add pages to the global libraries, making new contributions to knowledge. That's what a PhD is, right? There's one group that don't do that exactly, they're the ugly ducklings of the academy, the arts. They don't fit with the program because to one extent or another, they do not mine the world for symbols. One might say that in the arts, we take world and make more world. One might say, oh, that is, the arts are not usually concerned with a one-way translation from materiality to abstraction. These practices are examples of working in the performative idiom to deploy Andy Pickering's useful distinction. It's a mode that is more akin to gardening than to mining. Academic practice largely is, is in what uh, Pickering called the representational idiom. And Pickering juxtaposed this representational idiom with what he called the performative idiom. 
That is not to say that the performative is not present in academicized disciplines, but is often denigrated as mere laboratory work or implementation details, sometimes delegated to technicians. In hospitals, clinical diagnosis is seen as old fashioned, increasing, increasingly replaced by sensor equipped machines and such Technologies replace discernment of often subtle and multimodal cues, such as feeling a pulse or palpating a belly with symbolic output. A clarification is in order. The word representation is something of a morass because it has come to have various specialized meanings in different disciplines. In this discussion, I use representation and representational in the sense of Pickering's ontological dual, as opposed to his use of the term performative, which as noted, means essentially doing things in the world. In the arts, the term representation is deployed in a trivial way. A picture is a representation and some artworks include what we might call symbols, but questions of representational content in art artifacts is peripheral to the arguments of this paper. Representational modalities are deployed in the arts in the context of production. These have varying functions and varying degrees of abstraction, sketches, plans, maquettes, scores, recipes, and bodily mnemonic systems such as marking in dance. Such representational systems are deployed in generative procedures. These notational systems are deployed as devices that assist in making more world, to use my analogy. They are utilitarian representations. The utility of a map is not in its existence as such as a representational artifact, but in the fact that it helps you get the place you want to go. In some cases, these representational artifacts are materialized or reified. Fabrication jigs, drilling guides and tilting tables with precise angular positions. Such artifacts are instruments. And an instrument is a reified representation a representation that is reified to do work in the world. Online phenomena and the technological armature that undergirds them are of the representational idiom, scripts, authoring environments, markup languages, protocols, lookup tables, programming languages, operating systems, symbols made of symbols made of symbols, all the way down, we might say. Indeed, the idea of the separation of information from materiality is axiomatic in computer science. But this does not mean that performativity cannot exist in this world of representations. It clearly does. All online interaction is performative, from playing immersive online multiplayer games to online banking or a Zoom call. The paradoxical quality of this novel environment is precisely what demands our ongoing critical attention. Note the ontological reciprocality here. With respect to the paradox of representations in performative contexts, as I discussed in the arts, interactive online simulations are a new class of instrument, but the world they work in is a complicated world of nested representations that embodied users view from the outside and reach into like someone manipulating a net in an aquarium. VR and the metaverse do not change this, but rather advance us further into an uncanny valley of manipulable representations. A thorny question in the critical study of digital cultures regards the relationship between that performative surface 
and the logical depth below it. Can a system that is based in logic transcend the narrow logic, its narrow logical constraints? That is, is the cultural frippery of TikTok or Facebook stained through and through with a bias towards abstract symbolic logical discipline? And therefore, such digital, digital cultures, cultural, excuse me, therefore such digital cultural contexts enforce a computational way of thinking of life and society. A TikTok video is still a recording, of course, unlike, say, a Zoom call, which while live is a fabric of lively representations hung on an armature of logical procedures and protocols. Most academic output, as noted, is in the representational idiom. All representational artifacts, equations, diagrams, texts, programs, are models in two ways. They are representations and they, they are simplifications. They leave stuff out. Maps are only maps because they leave the vast majority of information out. This struck me while driving recently. A map app gets you from point A to point B very efficiently. But you can't query it, as in, where does that road go, or what's the name of that mountain or neighbourhood? Jorge Luis Borges's very short story on exactitude in science is rightfully famous because it is a succinct cautionary tale about the danger of taking the map for the territory. If we allied the map-like nature of online representations, we do so at our peril. This story on exactitude in science is about a, a country where fanatical cartographers felt that they needed a map that was at a one-to-one -one scale to the territory, um, a project which was later abandoned. So it's a very short story. There it is right there. Um, the problem is how to know what to leave out. Judgments of salience. Of all the material dimensions or sensorial experiences, how does one decide what aspects of a situation are salient and which are not? This sorting the wheat from the chaff process of simplification, simplification fundamental to the modelling process, can sometimes lead to tossing the baby out with the bathwater. Hamlet's advice should be on the frontispiece of every science textbook as a cautionary warning. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than ever dreamed of in your philosophy. There's a succinct capturing, in fact, of Pickering's um, uh, performative representational duel of all the lit. In some situations, any simplification will result in errors. Sometimes models are wrong because of the bluntness of data gathering or analytical instruments. For instance, the quality of microplastics in the ocean was underestimated by an order of magnitude because the sieves they used were too coarse to catch the multitude of small particles. This is like proving that there's no sand on the beach because you used a kitchen colander to do the measurements. More subtly, there's a problem of simply looking in the wrong place, like the old joke about the drunk looking for his keys in the snow under the street light. And when asked why he was where the keys were, he said they're over there. And they said, why are you looking over here? Because it's light over here. We only recently discovered that rats giggle when they're tickled because some bright spark thought to listen at frequencies higher than humans can hear. Smaller animals have higher voices. Who knew? So the history of engineering and physics is littered with cases where, where failure or disaster ensued because something that was regarded as being irrelevant was ignored. There's a joke about that too. I think it's the one about assume a spherical cow. A story in the history of the development of machine vision is 
illustrative, a 1980s neural net appeared to be highly effective in detecting camouflage tanks in a forest setting. This was military funded research, I take it. Until it was realized that the images of the forest with hidden tanks had been taken on cloudy days and the images of the forest without the tank had been taken on sunny days. The machine learning algorithm was not detecting, was, was detecting the presence of shadows, not of camouflaged tanks. Not even that. It knew nothing of shadows. It detected presumably salient variations in the grayscale value of adjacent pixels. Note that the system was trained on monochrome photographs. Already machine generated representations further reprocessed as pixelated images, representations all the way down. The system knew nothing of actual forests, actual tanks, actual weather, of mud, of breeze, of that kind of precipitation that hovers somewhere between a heavy fog and a microscopic drizzle. This, of course, is a truism in semiotics, pointed noted in René Magritte's painting The Treachery of Images, the title of his painting that has graced the cover of more than one text on semiotics. The warning, of course, is that it is a picture before it is a picture of a pipe, and it is not a pipe at all. Of course, what we see is a reproduction of a reproduction of reproduction, a procession, if not a precession, of simulacra that Jean Baudrillard presciently foretold long before internet web social technology would turbocharge, turbocharge that mediated condition. Uh, Bizarro's The Treachery of Plumbing. So increasingly through the pandemic, our interactions, our research and our pedagogy have gone online. And it's truly remarkable what we've been able to achieve under pressure. Researchers in the social sciences have been flocking to online experimental environments for all the obvious reasons. People don't have to come out, you don't have to suit up, and it's cheaper. But amongst this august body of researchers, few seem to have pondered the meaning of Magritte's warning. The assumption that our online environments adequately captures capture qualities of real world context is overdue for a deeper examination. The idea that a mouse or a touchscreen based experiment might be assumed to be equivalent for a given experimental scenario to moving physical tokens on a table is just sloppy. It's not just that interactive graphical worlds and the physical world have different affordances and constraints. They do. But design, designers of interactive graphic simulations might take great care in attempting to capture all that is salient about a real world context. But the technological conventions of the medium and the hardware elide the complex multimodality of real world experience by reducing sensory input to narrow and independent channels of image and sound peripheral vision and hearing, tactile sensations, olfaction, proprioception, and all their combinations are absent. That is not to say that screen-based experiments are wrong. We can learn a lot about how people interact with inter inter interactive digital representations, but one must take extreme caution when suggesting that one can derive from such observations general assumptions about human judgment or problem solving. There's a lot for us to learn about online interaction and there's a lot for us to learn about embodied materially engaged interaction. And there's a lot to learn about the differences between the two. We are not disembodied viewpoints when we interact online. There is virtual and real embodiment in online interaction 
and there are transfers of skills and there are failures of transfers of skills between the two. It's complex. And of course, we adapt and become naturalized to new contexts and we forget. We perform operations on representations and we derive judgments. My question here is, what is the source of the felt sense that something is right, true or correct? Consistent with the arguments of Mark Johnson, George Lakoff, Vittorio Galesi and others, I want to propose that the judgments that we make about images, diagrams, even equations are rooted in bodily knowing. I think Samuel Johnson was onto something when firmly kicking a large stone, he asserted, I refute it thus. Now the Wikipedia entry on the so-called appeal to the stone strenuously objects that such a refutation is a logical fallacy, specifically an informal fallacy. But such a vigorous refutation remains in a Gerdelian way confined to the same ontological system that Johnson refuted by stepping outside that Gerdelian frame. The general lesson of Gödel's incompleteness theorem is that one cannot describe the limits of a logical system with the logical language of that system. One has to zoom out, as it were, and deploy a more general language. In the same way, our representational systems are like Gerdelian nested Russian dolls. I propose that our intellectual systems are premised in a way that is seldom acknowledged on a kind of bodily knowing. I affirm the irrefutable veracity of the quality of knowing that is grounded in embodied experience. Those familiar with post-cognitivist discourses over the last 30 years will be unsurprised by this conception of knowing. To others, it might seem strange. It is rooted in a holistic, non-dualistic conception of cognition that's also biological, um, that can be traced back at least to Umberto Maturana's assertion that living systems are cognitive systems, and living as a process is a process of cognition. This statement is valid for all organisms with or without a nervous system. And I should make a footnote here that it's important for those of you who are not familiar with this discourse to recognize that cognitive science as we understand it now is in some way the collision of two quite contradictory philosophical forces. On the one hand, we have the traditional Western philosophy of mind rooted in um, a Cartesian dualistic notion, which asserts that mind and body are entirely separate kinds of substances and asserts a kind of um, uh, human exceptionalism as well. And on the other hand, a kind of biologically derived theory of cognition that says, as Umberto Maturana put it, you know, if you're alive, you're cognizant, and if you're cognizant, you're alive, whether you have a nervous system or not. So this biologically derived conception of cognition, cognition meshed with phenomenological approaches, Berkeley's own Hubert Dreyfus, among others, and Susan Hurley, Dorothea Legrand, and Maxine Sheets Johnston and others built out a notion of pre-reflective awareness, a kind of bodily knowing that you have before you have knowing in a conscious or linguistic sense. Interestingly, Johnston was a dancer and a choreographer before she moved into philosophy, which might explain her orientation to such ideas. Back in 1999, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson reminded us that 90% of cognition is unconscious. 
Therefore, we have to accept that all thought is unconscious before it is conscious. Such understandings destabilize any idea of the autonomy of conscious thought and open consideration for non-conscious cognition. Now, online media, especially in academic and pedagogical contexts, because they operate in this representational idiom, are therefore located firmly in the realm of conscious reasoning. Some kinds of real-world performative practices, I would argue, access pre-reflective awarenesses as part of a larger multimodal kind of cognition. Bodily knowing is, I submit to you, an aspect of pre-reflective awareness. It is this kind of knowing that is extrapolated and applied metaphorically and analogically to the knowing of abstract concepts. But metaphorically applying prior lessons of pre-reflective awareness is different from actually accessing pre-reflective awareness in real time. This might be one of the ways that we could characterize performatively operating in the realm of online images as opposed to performatively operating in the world of embodied materiality and terrestrial physics. The real world, it turns out, has a capacity for serendipity, accidents and surprise that is often strained out of online simulations. Take, for instance, the constrained and contrived case of the nine dot triangle puzzle. When played with coins on a table, coins can be dropped, they can be bumped, they can roll, they can roll revealing possibilities. And such possibilities, importantly, are not coded as failures as they might be in a logically representational context in which there are correct and incorrect answers. As Wendy Ross concurs, failure is often more generative in the physical world because it is not coded as failure. Experiments that relate exclusively to online behavior are on safer ground, but even then, the experimental subjects are not disembodied AIs, but embodied humans with diverse prior experiences. As it happens, I'd never seen the nine dot puzzle, but when I was recently shown it in a diagram, I saw the solution immediately. So I was amazed when the experimenters reported that in many cases, subjects made 50 attempts. I was prompted to wonder what in my experience made this task trivial for me. I don't have a definitive answer, but I have two ideas. The first is that I've spent an awful lot of time with very tangible problems of efficiently using available materials to achieve certain tangible ends. To make a box out of a certain dimensions with least cuts and joinery from this pile of miscellaneous bits of wood, that sort of thing. I propose that generalizable abstract understandings can be derived from such experiences. And further, I contend Solving such real world problems is exactly why, evolutionarily, humans have a brain in the first place. And that abstract knowledge is a game we play with the brain in its downtime. My second idea has to do with a minor kind of dyslexia that I suffer from. As a kid, I was a late reader, a late writer, and I could never tell the time on a clock face. I still, to be honest, have no clear idea of left and right. But on the other hand, I have very precise 3D visualization skills that I take for granted until it becomes evident to me that things I take for granted are opaque to others. For instance, this image here, which is of a uh, path made of asymmetrical river stones. I may, sorry, I may have got my slides out of order here for just a minute. Any case, um, some years ago, so I live in a neighborhood where these kind of stones are so common, they're a nuisance. So some years ago, I was laying a front path by fitting these kind of stones together. I had a pile of stones varying from grapefruit to football size. And I had to find a likely contender and fit it into the wedge shaped gap left by stones already laid, preferably with a more or less flat face 
flat level face uppermost. Sometimes I had to excavate and accommodate some protrusion, then I would tamp down and move on to the next gap. I was quietly amusing myself with this project when someone offered to help. And after a while, I realized I'd laid 10 stones and they were still struggling with their second. Reflecting on this later, it occurred to me that my inability to distinguish P from Q or B from D, while a significant disability in the world of alphanumeric symbols, was an asset in this world of objects. B and D are indeed the same thing, just seen from different perspectives. This, is, this example serves to illustrate the challenges inherent in designing psychological experiments and online simulations in particular. What kind of interactive simulation could adequately simulate the relevant situated and proprioceptive cues that came into play in this playful problem solving? I was involved in the development of virtual reality in the mid 90s. I disputed the embodiment rhetoric that was touted by its proponents. It was blatantly apparent to me that when you donned the iPhones, you checked your body at the door. You can't sit on a virtual chair, and if you walk too far, the cable would tear, your, tear the iPhones off your head or you'd bump into a screen. In those days, all virtual reality exhibits and experiments were equipped with minders who were constantly warning users to be careful, sometimes having to physically restrain them. Embodiment in virtual reality amounts to a dynamic stereoscopic illusion and may be a 3D pointer. Virtual reality is and always has been proprioceptively an augmented reality, or perhaps I would say an MCR, that is mutually conflicting realities. Not much has changed, it's just got cheaper, faster, smaller and slightly friendlier. In the early days of public VR in the 90s, people would become nauseous because the image feed could not keep up with the speed of head movement, especially rotation, which we humans can do quite fast because we have flexible necks. What happens is quite like seasickness. The nausea is a result of a mismatch between sensory experience of the vestibular canals and changes in the visual field. Half a century ago, US Navy was having some issues with pilots crashing planes. These are expensive mistakes. It transpired that the pilots who crashed had recently done sessions in flight simulators, like the one above, without motion platforms. Experiments revealed that when in a simulator in which the screen showed, showed a, a moving horizon, um, like, you know, as if the plane was rolling, but the vestibular system told them that they were just sitting in a chair, the signal from the vestibular system was switched off. And that resolved the nausea. And this happened almost instantly. But when the pilots got into real planes, they could no longer take advantage of their vestibular awareness, which is why they crashed. This syndrome became known as simulator sickness. Happily, the cure was simply a good night's sleep, during which time the vestibular signals reconnected. I think it's reasonable to assume that when we work online, play screen-based games, etc., something akin to simulator sickness might occur. Our sensory motor capabilities are unconsciously edited, and perhaps we do not notice that our sensory motor world remains edited when we return to meat space. A curtailing of proprioceptive sensitivities can lead, excuse me, to poor balance or stumbling, to clumsy or ham-fisted behavior. And such awkwardness is observed in some children. 
In overexposed children and infants, there's cause for concern regarding more permanent neurological, oculomotor and sensory motor development. There's a growing array of experimental and demographic data on this subject, some more conclusive than others. It is likely to be unpopular research, as it will destabilize some of the liberatory rhetoric uh, of, um, of computer and internet corporate interests, and likewise destabilize aspects of the endorsement of such technologies by universities and school systems. So uh, if the price of liberty is eternal vigilance, we might have been asleep at the wheel. Okay, here my story, and I'm getting to the end now. Here my story about the academy and my story about digital media converge. Digital media and digital computing generally take as axiomatic the dualistic separation of matter and information. And this, we must always note, is a conventional assumption which, like the mind-body dualism, has no existence in reality. The historical lesson here is that the commitment to Western philosophical tradition, of the Western philosophical tradition, to abstract symbolic knowledge, informs digital computing. Digital computing consist in, consists in the man, manipulation of symbolic tokens by logical rules, a system of mathematical logic devised by George Boole, a Victorian country parson. He died in 1864, the year of the first transatlantic telegraph cable, and he never saw a light bulb. Digital computing is at root the mechanization of Victorian mathematical logic. Our online teaching environments are modelled on traditional pedagogical practices. Practices that privilege abstract symbolic knowledge. The style of conventional college pedagogy has been replicated online. Text, lectures, labs, quizzes. This is fine for STEM teaching, STEM teach to the test kind of learning. And except for the delivery environment, not much has really changed. It's hardly surprising that academic practices of representational and symbolic abstraction have ported so smoothly to the online context, because it is a world of representations. The oft bandied term instruction speaks volumes, as do the internet jargon terms content provider and delivery. But we must remember, instruction and education are not synonymous. As W.B. Yeats poetically said, education is not the filling of a pail, it is the lighting of a fire. As we move towards more online pedagogy with larger enrolments, there's no mystery about what is lost everything that was gained in small in-person contexts. There's no debate about the value of personal mentorship or of the value of, of the trust that we can develop between people who exist for each other as more than a tiny talking head. But perhaps more profoundly, teach to the test instruction delivery conceptions encourage students to assume that problems are already defined. In the real world, figuring out what the problem is, is necessarily prior. And that takes a mode of intelligence that is quite different from, and perhaps diametrically opposed to, problem solving. The assumption that cognition, and thus pedagogy, is about problem solving, has its roots in Cold War style cognitive science, that Les Levido amusingly characterized as paranoid rationality. The assumption that cognition and thus, and thus pedagogy is about problem solving, I said that. So a, an, a teacher of mine once said to me something that I, I think is um, a very wise thing. He said, art is not about getting the right answers, it's about, it's about asking the right questions. 
In the current context, the profundity of this remark cannot be underestimated. What kinds of thinking are involved in asking the right questions? Generative conjecture, open-ended experimenting, learning from failure, critical analysis, how to develop an opinion and present an argument, and so on. The question that I have in general about online pedagogy is who's teaching these skills and where are the apps in which these skills are taught? I haven't seen them. Perhaps it's just that my university didn't buy them. Lastly, pedagogies of embodied practice just don't port online because the online environment is dedicated to exclusively to the representational idiom. I'm a sculptor, but I haven't taught a uh, shop class in two years. Because such pedagogy, deeply connected to materiality, is, I'm afraid, inherently incompatible with online delivery. Can you learn to throw a pot from a YouTube video? You might learn about the task, but nothing in that prepares you to learn proprioceptively about how to handle uh, a massive, sticky, wobbling, semi-rigid mass of mud. Bob Ross could show you what the process of making a painting looked like, but nothing in his shows can tell you about manipulating a blob of sticky grease held amongst stiff hairs on the end of a stick. So I've got, I think I've got three conclusions. One is a critique of, of the general commitment of the conventional academy to notions of abstract knowledge, an idea that has deep roots in Western rationalist and humanist thought. This commitment involves an exact extractive attitude, obtaining abstract information from the world, generating texts, equations, maps, diagrams, and models. And these representations are then instrumentalized as abstract machines we call representations, uh, excuse me, that we call simulations or models. The second aspect of the, is a critique of internet culture as an environment that is almost entirely composed of representations and simulations. We ought to heed the warnings of Magritte and Borges, and consider carefully the way that such simulatory environments are deployed for research and pedagogical ends. Thirdly, the paper calls for greater credence to be paid to the ways that embodied being in the world provides the basis for a grounded kind of knowledge. Intelligent action in the world deploys such knowledge in skillful performance as exemplified in the arts. Such knowing exists in an ontological realm that is different from that realm valorized by the academy. The pandemic shoved faculty and institutions headlong into online delivery. The effort to instantly pivot was extremely challenging for faculty as it was for students. It was enormously fortuitous that when the pandemic hit, Internet infrastructure and environments, such as Google Docs, Zoom, Canvas, and so on, were just mature enough that there wasn't a total collapse in the educational system. One can only wonder what we might have done if COVID had hit in 2010. For better or worse, the internet behemoths stepped in to the breach and profited handsomely, as have Moderna and Pfizer. Having warp speeded a potentially decades long development of online mass education in two years, administrators and managers have no doubt noted the possibility of doubling enrollment without adding a classroom. Economically and strategically, online instruction is clearly here to stay, as long as we have an internet. To the extent that it's economically attractive to institutions to maintain the pivot to online, we can assume it will remain a fixture of college life into the future. 
A social justice issue is looming. Online education being lower cost will attract lower income groups to lower budget institutions, potentially making small group in-person pedagogy the province of the rich. As the dust settles around the pandemic pivot to online everything, the accelerated transition into online pedagogy and research has revealed new challenges and new questions. Much careful research is required to consider the qualities of online research and pedagogy. The results, results of that research will reveal new design challenges. Thank you, everyone. I hope you found that to be oh interesting. That says thank you. And that's the, uh, the cover of my book. And I shall now stop sharing. I think I have to escape out of Keynote again. Thank you so much, Professor Penny. Uh, um, and so now we're going to move on to discussion and questions. And so um, with Zoom, it's definitely easier for me if you raise the virtual hand, uh, just because I can't see everybody. And so um, I think to some extent I can kind of facilitate this, but honestly, Professor Penny, it might just be easier for you to call on people as they raise their hands. So whatever works. I can do that. do that. If you raise your hand, it will throw you into the top left corner of the screen, which is always helpful. Um, so please keep it up while you're talking. Um, and and um, if you prefer to enter a question or point into the chat, then um, by all means do so. Perhaps, Sam, if you could monitor the chat channel. Yeah, I keep an eye on that. That's a great idea. Um, so okay, actually, I'll I'll start off. I have a question right away. <laughs> um, so I uh, something I've been kind of grappling with. I'm in Doors Lab, um, and we talk about embodied cognition all all the time. I was going to say often, but that's that's an understatement. It's all the time. And um, I've been trying to make sense of um, this sort of. I obviously came in here with sort of a dualist perspective, and that's still a big part of the way I see the world for sure. I'm trying to sort of like uh, grapple these two ideas together to some extent. And today in your talk, you talked about this idea of consciousness. And um, I'm trying to mm, kind of before this talk, I probably thought of consciousness and cognition as relatively the same thing. And now I'm questioning whether or not like maybe what their distinction is. And I, and I thought maybe you thought about that and maybe you'd have some insight into how consciousness and cognition might be not exactly the same thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and I should say that when I started writing this paper, it rapidly bifurcated into two papers. So there's a kind of um, twin to this paper, which is currently going by the title of How a Body Knows. Uh, and I do talk about that a little more in that paper, but it's a very good question. And um, I will say, firstly, that the, the, the points that come out of um, uh, embodied cognitive neuroscience research, uh, you know, over the past 25 years or so, um, in many cases have reinforced the idea that um, a substantial amount of what we might call in a broad sense cognition occurs prior to consciousness, prior to us being aware, right? So quite clearly, you know, I'm talking to you now and I'm hearing the words coming out of my mouth, but the process of assembling those ideas into words, into grammatical structures is completely, I'm oblivious to it. It's just happening, right? So, so I think it's not a bad analogy for many, many different kinds of cognitive processes that we're engaged in. And, you know, as Lakoff and Johnson said, 90% of cognition is unconscious, right? And as I said, Legrand and, and um, Susan Hurley and, and Maxine Sheets Johnson, very emphatic, in, diff in their different ways about the way that we know about our being in the world prior to the voice in the head narrating it to us. And I'm particularly interested in that kind of knowing. You know, I see consciousness as the tip of the iceberg and it's absurd to talk about the tip of the iceberg without acknowledging the pressure, the presence of the iceberg. 
does that does that help or do you, would you like to that definitely helps i think that i'm gonna it's one of those topics that in my mind i'm gonna slowly be making sense of but that's a really really wonderful starting point thank you i'm happy to uh point you to to other references um uh you know i mean one of the one of the one of the streams of thinking that that feed into this comes from mark johnson the philosopher and and then you know in his collaborations with with george lakoff um and johnson wrote a book back in the 80s late 80s called the body in the mind um and he has this kind of interesting stories or interesting ideas uh that um, and essentially, he asks the question, where do we get concepts from? Where do we get abstract concepts from? And his argument is because clearly, you know, unless you believe that you they kind of beam down into your pineal gland from some, you know, heaven of cosmic ideals, um, then you have to ask, you have to answer that question. Where do we get concepts from? Where do we get abstract concepts? Where do we get the concept of, of equivalence, for instance, that we apply to mathematics? Which is obviously, you know, a big deal in Dawes Lab. And uh, Johnson would argue that we get the concept of equivalence from the bodily experience of balance. And he would say, you know, there he is walking home with two, two shopping bags and one of them's got books in it and the other one's got groceries in it. And if he's not being pulled to the left or the right, then in some way there's an equivalence between these two quanti quantities which are quite different, you know oranges and books so so the the kind of this notion is extrapolated by by uh lakoff and galazi in in a in an interesting paper where they where they talk about the sort of how these concepts that are rooted in motor and sensory neurological circuits are the very sources of the concepts that then become attached to linguistic notions, you know, another another of the ones they love to talk about is the is the is the metaphorical idea of grasping, you know, you are grasping what I'm saying. We use that word, you know, and it's quite clear that 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 in that that would originate, you know, could potentially or probably originates. In a, in a bodily experience. I, I grasp the cup, I grasp what you're saying. And it's quite, actually, it's quite mysterious how, how these concepts can metaphorize. But anyway, there's, there's more to talk about. I'm very pleased to, to, uh, to, to pass things on to you. I see Dor is next in line. Or is that okay? If we Thank move? you. Thanks, Simon, so much for this talk. And uh, of course, we, we all appreciate the, the irony of uh, online lecture about the limitations of <laughs> online lectures and 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 i should say that i for one really appreciate the online medium now because it enables me to be in my bodily comfort like mm. if i were in this i'm lying down on my trampoline if i were this <laughs> in this posture in the hall it would be socially unacceptable which is another interesting question of why we are all so um posturous <laughs> right. Um, I, I, I want to begin by, by a comment that um, my family was bewildered how throughout COVID we were all uh, learning, teaching and learning um, each other and other people to engage in, in actually well fully embodied practices. My, my wife and children uh, thrived in online courses doing uh, community uh, movements like capoeira and karate and voice training, singing, piano playing, and well, yeah, painting. Yeah, thanks, Bob Roth. And, and really developing exquisite skills that I would never have predicted one could have actually accomplished, not to mention people doing baking and, and cooking and weaving and et cetera, et cetera. So that's that kind of gave me pause, but uh, where, where, where I wanted to, to, to take this as, is, well, clearly, as you know, you yourself as a scientist and user of, of, of digital technology and designer of digital, it's, it's not like you're a Luddist, right? You're not coming and telling us 
let's break the machines, etc. And I, as I was listening to to the lecture, I was wondering whether we we should be a bit cautious with avoiding what might be a lurking uh, like category error. I'll call it. Uh, first, I'll state it, then I'll explain it. Between uh, between media and uh, uh, maybe semiotics. Now, but media, I mean the, the the digital technologies that are emerging, and of course, we are still in the kind of desert generation where all the crap you know we are all uh, the generation of subject zero with, with uh, you know with pain in our in our wrists from typing and all of this terrible stuff they're giving us i mean after the typing all i want to do is, is, is grasp literally my cello because there's nothing like that it's, um so there's the media which are you know a pain in the neck literally and and then there are semiotics this issue of um representations and you know what Latour called the cascade of representations and I I wondered if by by a con if we could consider by way of juxtaposition your work your own fascinating work with the canoe builders in Polynesia and they too are not always hands-on with the canoes and the and the various uh, tools but they might discuss these things and in discussing they will use words they will use gestures and i'm trying to recall from your research if sometimes they might even make little etchings of plans in various uh, uh okay okay um so i i just I'm, I'm curious if there's not some kind of category error here between the media that are enabling these various kinds of representations on one hand and the representation, the representational practice itself, that we are always engaged in, moving, as Jean calls it, from action to symbol. So yeah, so that I guess is the my, my the, the sum total of my query for now. Hmm. It's uh, it's not. I, I, I'm, I, don't, I don't feel that I've got a good answer for you. It's certainly something I'd like to continue talking with you about. Um, you know, I think, I hope that my, you know, general feeling, and I, and I appreciate you all being here and listening to this paper in perhaps not a, a, a you know, a fully resolved state. I'm very interested to hear um, any responses, um, but, For me, Pickering's distinction between the re representational and the performative has been a very strong uh, kind of structuring idea. Um, but, you know, rather like um, uh, Kirsch and Maglio's distinction between epistemic and pragmatic action, uh, the, the separation is not clear in actual life. And as you say, the you know the case of of act learning well certain kinds of embodied practices via this representational medium is does raise all sorts of interesting questions um how does that work how how is it that you can um you know become competent at, at something like capoeira or karate um, through this medium of of images. I think there's certainly something about the live moving image that that we would have to carve off and 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 see as separate. And it, you know, and it's a and it's a it's an odd kind of a context where. Um, there is performity within the realm of representations. Maybe someone else can help me with that. I mean, by, by, by extreme conjecture, I may be in front of a highly pixelated, <laughs> a high fidelity screen, and I see my, you know, my karate coach there showing me a, a, you know, how to, a punch or whatever. And I literally 
could not tell if I'm seeing a real person or I'm putting some chamber of mirrors because the fidelity is so high. Now, granted, I could not come and grasp his hands and all those things that we do when we teach people physical skills. And yet it goes such a long way. So it's not really about whether or not it's a representation. It's really rather it's about, and, and you mentioned your colleague Antoinette is looking at, right? Are these illusions? I, I, it's a tom d'oeil. I, I literally do not know if, if, it's, if it's real or not. So as far as the, the sheer visual facade in front of me, I'm, I'm fooled. And, and again, with all those caveats that nobody can literally change my posture and correct me, all those wonderful things that we do when we teach people how to teach our children to tie their laces or our teenagers to flip an armless. But I wonder, I wonder if, if you would have that uh, capacity to, um, to understand the image if you had never seen a movie or a television. You know, there's that story uh, uh, in the early days of cinema of the, I think it was the Lumiere brothers setting up the image of the, of the train coming into the station and, 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 and people ran from the cafe uh, because they could. <laughs> Literally, I, I know when I show my dog a picture of a bone, he's not too impressed. Right. Um, and even, even a video of a bone doesn't work that well. Yeah, even though apparently animals do watch the Nature Channel, not not that ours because we don't have a TV, but that's enough. <laughs> uh, but, so you are speaking now a bit about about certain media literacies. Mm. Uh, but um, as I say, I, I don't think uh, media is now at the level where I can actually not know if something is real or not under certain conditions. And when I do, then I'm sure surely I what, what's that called suspended disbelief. Um, uh, but you know what? Simon, why don't we let other people also apply? Absolutely. We have, I'm conscious of the time, but you and I will certainly continue. <laughs> um, so, I think the Rati's camera, I think Julian had a question coming from that group. Uh, yes, I was the one who pressed the raise hand <laughs> button. Uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for the um, wonderful um, talk. Um, I kind of have two uh, related uh, questions. Um, the first one is about this, this dichotomy between um, the representational and the performative. And I'm curious, um, there must be a boundary somewhere where it's not so clear which side of the dichotomy we fall. And, and a few examples that I'm thinking of here in the context of math is um, the notion of um, graspable math when you the idea that when you manipulate symbols on a page on, on, on paper, you do this in a very um, perceptual motor way. You 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 see the affordances of various symbols. You can pick them up and put them on the other side of the equation, and it flips the sign. So, so so there's a very performative element to that. Also, maybe diagrams are maybe an even better example when you you add an auxiliary line, you 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 see relations and and all that. So yeah, I'm just curious how you make sense of that, the boundary between those two domains. Um, and my second question. Um, is about when you talked about um, representations uh, and digital um, artifacts, you 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 uh, trace the connection to a sort of a Cartesian dualist tradition. Um, but if we are committed to a sort of an inactive, embodied uh, understanding of of cognition and and the world, um, then there must be a way of explaining how we develop computers, how we engage with digital artifacts. Um, from an inactive perspective. So even though the invention of those artifacts was maybe motivated by a Cartesian dualist philosophy, we still have to be able to explain or account for how those artifact, uh, artifacts work uh, from an embodied inactive perspective. And I'm just curious how you, you sort of navigate that. Uh, yeah, I hope that, those, yeah. Are, those are both really interesting questions. Um, what I you know, I'm, I'm beginning to feel that any, I mean, I'm immediately suspicious of any dualisms or any, any binary constructions and, and clearly um, Pickering's uh, uh, performative and, and, uh, um, and representational are, are also um, ripe for such critique. Um, and as I tried to make clear, it's, become clear to me that in the process of embodied performative practice, we utilize representations and representational systems. 
So, you know, as I was saying, these examples of sketches or or marking in dance are are these curious hybrid um, practices which are both performative and symbolic at the same time. Um, and I think that's fascinating. So I'm I'm not saying there's a distinction. I'm saying that they are somehow woven and nested into each other. And and the the opposite is always true. Also true that in this realm of representations, should we say interactive representations, manipulating some sort of interactive application or simply navigating the web, you know, we are engaged in a performative practice in the context of this representational scenarios. So I, I don't claim that I, I, what I'm suggesting is that there's really important sort of cognitive philosophical work to be done to to grasp what is the nature of cognition you know when we engage with these kind of online contexts because i think simply that there has been a kind of um rush to implement certain kinds of things and we have not noticed that the environment, the affordances, the constraint, the, co the sort of embodied cognitive constraints of the online environment, you know, are different and, and th therefore there must be different qualities to them. I mean, quite clearly, um, uh, you know, the limitations of, of, as I said, the way that the media physically are kind of constrained and sliced up. You know, we have two channels of audio and a very narrow field of vision, which is managed in certain kinds of illumination with certain kinds of resolution. You know, there are aspects to being in the world. Proprioception, peripheral vision, um, olfaction, the kind of vestibular awarenesses that we might utilize in doing something like riding a horse. That simply are not present in, you know, an online simulation simulation of horse riding, even if even if it's simply watching a an old Western movie, you know. I, I, so I'm I'm really all I'm calling for is is that uh, there's a lot there that has has not really been explored, and I've, you know quite clearly, I mean, people like you in Dawes Lab are really in the position to be forced to ask the questions in what way is, for instance, the pedagogical experience of a screen based um, uh, uh, simulation different from manipulating tokens on a table in a social environment, you know, and so on. I think these are open questions. I, yeah. Oh, yeah, thanks. That's, uh, that's, that's very, that's very helpful. Uh, one thing I, I thought of when you, when you were uh, responding is that maybe to the extent that say the vestibular system is recruited when I engage with some digital problem is because I've had previously had experiences in the world where my vestibular system was engaged and if I yes. had, had those if I wasn't bringing that with me the, the experience would be even more impoverished than it than it is uh, no no that, no that's exactly right and so one of my questions is um, you know in 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 the in parallel I suppose to the theme that I was drawing out with with um, the the basis of abstract concepts in embodied experiences, right? I was talking about Lakoff and Galazi, etc. You know, when we experience an online uh, situation of a situation that we already have learned about in real life in meat space, you're absolutely right. We bring all sorts of experiences. We bring all sorts of prior experience to that. And we understand it because of that prior experience. And if we were to, uh, you know, watch a video or or, or so on of um, some practice that we were completely unfamiliar with, then we wouldn't be drawing on that reserve of knowledge. And this is, you know, this is what I was saying about about. Um, and this is one of the questions I have about embodied cognition, right, is, is what do we bring 
to a, shall we say, less embodied context through our experience of being an embodied person in the world. You know, if I know how to ride a skateboard and I see a video of someone, you know, going downstairs and falling over and roll, you know, and, and hurting themselves, there's a visceral kind of ouch to that, that, you know, someone who had never done that might, um, might not comprehend in the same way. Just want to quickly draw attention to the time and I'd love to hear Antoinette's question really quick and we've got about two minutes, but maybe we can hear the question in a quick response. I'd love if that was something Thank we Thank you for off. being patient, Antoinette. Um, no, no problem. Um, I want to push back just a little bit, Simon, on this question of uh, lack of embodiment. And I think that it's very easy to very attractive to go after the experiences that are the most symbol, sort of symbolic, least <laughs> physically engaged, like sitting in front of a screen watching a lecture and create that as the icon of everything possible. And of course, I'm in agreement with you on this question of huge problems about what we should be and shouldn't be trying to do online. And dumping everything online. I'm an artist as well as a writer and I trained with traditional media before I became a digital media artist. So I understand this problem of balance very well. But the couple of things that I do a lot that I think may be more interesting models to think about than the than sort of the, the Zoom problem. One is when I'm playing a game, an online game like like something like World of Warcraft. It's more like driving a car or playing the piano. Like one hand is doing one thing with high degree of skill. The other hand is doing something quite different on my trackball because I don't like mice. And then, you know, my mind is trying to comprehend the whole in a, in a, in a dimensional sense because I am navigating in space and my body feels engaged at a lot of different levels that have been already brought up. The, the visceral, the reactive, you know, when you get uh, so that it's, it is a very, very embodied experience. And of course there's sound as well. I'm talking my way through this, through this with the community of people that I'm gaming with. The other thing I wanted to point to is drawing. I do a great deal of digital drawing and it has a lot in common with regular drawing, but it's a very physically different thing because the touch of the object, the stylus is different, the layers, the things I'm doing with my hand, it is a learned physical set of techniques, even if what I am ending up with is a bunch of um, uh, zeros and ones that are being stored on the hard drive instead of a bunch of wet crap drawing on a piece of paper. So I think that one can, it may be, you know, productive to also look at the places where embodiment is incredibly important to mastery and not just the, the situations where we can say leaving too much of the body out of the question does create a, um, a limited and um, diminished experience. No, so it's really you. not really a question, but a, a kind of a more no, comment. No, I, Sorry, no, it's, it's a really important point, and, and thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I think, you know, I've thought a lot about um, the, the condition of, of uh, immersion into different kinds of semi-immersive environments like gaming. You know, and I think your analogy with driving is 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 interesting and relevant. So I think about it through the idea of the tool or the prosthetic sometimes, you know, and and but in in the case of the, the, the online gaming, you know, whether it's a first person or a third person situation, you you have to some extent carried a sense of your own embodiment into the temporal and spatial, you know, visual, probably not stereoscopic, but certainly temporal and, and th there's optic flow and all these other things going on as you move your avatar through virtual spaces. So there is a kind of imaginative embodiment and I don't dispute that in the slightest fact, I think it's extraordinarily mysterious, but it's also rooted in 
the fact that you know how to run and the game designers know how to drive the viewpoint of a running uh, um, first person kind of agent identity and somehow you know that meshes together so that you can find immersion uh, in that context right and I, 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 I again I, I think it's a very important point and I think that these kind of spaces where we do experience this engagement in digital environments is is is, is are, are truly fascinating um i we're a little over so i'm just gonna jump in here and i just wanted to say what a wonderful talk and honestly i always love the discussion even more and i thought the discussion was fantastic and i'm actually quite disappointed that we're wrapping it up now because i thought it just got especially tasty and exciting and juicy with um, antoinette's question there so but I do know that we have uh, people have places they have to go. So I just want to say thank you so much, uh, Professor Penny. And thank you so much, everybody, for joining. And if we could just give one last quick round of applause. And um, we'll see you all uh, soon. And thank you so much. Yes. Thank you very much, Bye, everyone. everyone.